Join us next for stories of the risen Christ, alive and well and living in believers like you and me. Our guest today is Ron Matson, presenter of Evidence for the Exodus and president of Koinonia House in this part two of a series of interviews. Today, Ron shares about his friendship with Chuck Missler, his travels and thoughts on ministry. And so Malcolm's been here, as you said, nearly 40 years, Malcolm and Carol, just showing the faithfulness of God. And I know that in your life that God has been faithful, but it seems like he has brought you to many different types of experiences and many places. Currently president of Koinonia House, founded by Chuck Missler. And maybe you could familiarize our listeners with Chuck Missler, as some may not be familiar with him. Right. Chuck Missler was an incredible individual. As a young man, he showed uh, great academic capabilities. So as a result of that, uh, when he graduated from high school, he had two opportunities. One was to get a full ride scholarship to Stanford in engineering. The second was to be given an appointment to the Naval Academy in Annapolis. And he was enamored with the idea of going to the Naval Academy. So he did his four years there, graduated with honors, and took his commission at that point in the Air Force. But he was also an individual from a very early age. He was impacted by Christian teaching. And so he found himself really in love with the Bible. He was the benefactor of some good Bible teaching. So as his career began to go very quickly up in trajectory, he spent four years in the the Air Force, got married, began to start a family. And at that time also, again, began to surround himself with with the available Bible teaching that was around, but he was an upward mobile executive. When he was 29 years old, he became the director of quality assurance for Ford Motor Company. Oh, my goodness. 29 years old. He worked for Lee Iacocca at that point. Did he? uh, Yep. And he was responsible for the quality engineering effort on the introduction of the Ford Mustang in 1963. So this is pretty pretty heady stuff for a guy that's just in his late 20s, early 30s. In fact, he was at that time, he was the youngest senior executive at Ford Motor Company in their history. So he was seen as one of their whiz kids. He did that for five years and went on and started a computer timeshare company that eventually was bought by ADP, Automated Data Processing and invented a lot of technology. In parallel to that, his hunger for the Bible was just more and more. And it was really when he got involved with a fellow by the name of Walter Martin and also Hal Lindsey and then Chuck Smith in Southern California. And the four of them were sort of banditos together in (laughs) one sense. But Missler was the technical oddball in the group that came in, but he was surrounded by some brilliant minds. So early on at Calvary Costa Mesa, by the early 80s, he had become the chief executive officer of Western Digital, who had their headquarters in Orange County. And he was attending Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. He was on the board of Calvary Costa Mesa and began to teach Monday night Bible studies there. And, and people would go to listen to his studies back then because obviously from his perspective, Chuck Smith was doing the expositional teaching of the Bible. So Chuck would teach these extraordinary Bible studies of technology and and the Bible and, uh, you know, codes and all these, you know, faces on the moon kind of stuff. <laughs> I remember as a, as a young man at the church at that time feeling like, wow, I'm, I'm watching, you know, a nutty professor up there teach the Bible. <laughs> so really, I was aware of his ministry. I, I, I liked what he did. I liked that he was focused on on just taking the Bible and, and, and looking at it in, in more interesting ways in one sense. And it was 1992 when I was living with my family in England. I had gone there as a management consultant for the IBM Corporation. That I finally met Chuck. I came to our house. I had to pick him up at the airport to get him to a meeting. And so we met, spent time together, and that really forged what would become a lifelong experience with him. So as it, the commentaries were coming out and we were living in England and we started Cornelia House Europe, I was put on the board of directors, and by 2015, I was elected as the CEO and president of the corporations. And then he died, of course, in 2008, May of May 1st of 2018. So, uh, but the legacy of Chuck is continuing and, and, in fact, increasing. People are finding that things said 30 years ago or 40 years ago are still very relevant, especially in the area of prophecy. Chuck was he was into prophecy but not one who would grasp quickly the latest interesting thing. He was very cautious 
For example, he did a study in the 90s on the danger of biotechnology. Oh, and, wow. And, uh, of course, back then, who was interested in that? I mean, gene splicing and all that. He was talking it from a biblical point of view, of course. And, of course, it was one of those teachings that just went flat and eventually just went off the shelf. And then recently, we, we remastered that, put it back out. And, of course, tens of thousands of people are listening to it because right. given what we know now about the biological uh, tinkering that's going on and just how dangerous it is. And he had, of course, equated that as a foreshadow of what would probably come in the end times. And, of course, he didn't live to see what we see now. But uh, certainly those types of teachings are what we call evergreen. Right. And, and as you said, like the nutty professor, because I'm sure at the time people thought, this is crazy. This can't, you know, who would have thought looking from back then, looking ahead at the days that we're in today, there are many things going on in the world that we wouldn't have thought, would we? No, no. And part of it is this, is that myself coming from a working in a technical world, I, I worked at Calvary Chapel for four years, but then eventually, I, because of Malcolm, he planted this desire in both my and my wife's heart to not just simply stay in the United States, but to, to travel and, and to be more missionaries, but not the missionaries in the classic sense of going out and soliciting support, but rather supporting ourselves, uh, being tent makers. And so I went back into the engineering world and worked my way to a point to where the Lord just sort of like Joseph to a place to where I found myself in a very high-end technology company as a project manager. But enough about me. The point is, is that when you're in that field, you are in one sense used to seeing stuff in the now that people won't see for many years. We would call those secret programs. Truth of the matter is, they won't be secret when they're made public. And so you transition that technology into also a way in which you can look at things biblically. You're, you're seeing things that you know will come to fruition, but because of the Secrets Act or whatever, you're not able to, but you can see biblically where that's coming around. So you act in one sense like a technology prophet in that you're not predicting that which is unknown to come to being. The difference is you're seeing stuff that eventually will be revealed you just know about it ahead of time. And so that's why Missler's teaching was so insightful was because in one sense on the technology side, he was ostensibly an information scientist. And so it's all about communication information. And so you can see where that will go. So when you speak about this is what will happen in the next five years, you sound like a prophet, but in fact, you're just getting that from the boardroom. And hearing these things and then just sharing them as no one else was doing. Yes. I guess. Nobody else was doing what he was doing. Yeah. It was a, to be honest, Chuck Messler was really an enigma to me because the more our personal friendship grew, I had worked with, with, especially at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa and Maranatha Music, worked with many, 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 many people that are in the Christian realm, very famous, and got to know people even outside of that ring, that Christianity has its own, you know, aristocracy. And Chuck was one of those that had every right to be considered inside of that group, but he was always surprised when people would even remember his name. He was honestly the most humble, great man I've ever met in my life because he, he just didn't take himself seriously. In fact, people would come up to him and say, wow, Chuck, I've been listening to you for so many years and I would, I've just, it's such an honor to meet you. And they, they had that, you know, that endearing sort of look and Chuck's normal response to that was, if you think I'm impressive, you need to get out more. <laughs> I mean, and, and he wasn't just being, you know, turning a, a phrase to be funny, because I've been around people who have a very good uh, way of, of having this public face of them just being these sweet, normal people. But man, they, behind the scene, <laughs> mean. They're, they're somebody else. And, and, and Chuck was the opposite. He was just, in his mind, a, a person that, that God was using in his own sovereign way. And as a result, I think that you see that what he is doing is larger now. After his death, as a CEO, I thought, okay, typical patriarchal ministry, one guy, we're going to have the, the backlog of what he's done and just simply produce radio programs, television programs, and we're done. Of course, a year or so later, COVID happens and our ministry doubles. I mean, the reason why is because we have so much online material. Right. And in fact, I think it's safe to say we probably have the most online video and audio material of any ministry in the world. And I would say over 1,500 hours of Bible teaching, various platforms and things to be able to distribute that. So the ministry hasn't shrunk. In fact, if anything, it's, it's, it's grown, grown exponentially, yes. Wow. There's the radio program, yes. 6640, yep. Chuck Missler, and K-House TV. Yes. And various audio, video recordings available. Yes. And then 
just as you were saying, the Koinonia Institute, that probably was something that people would be quite interested in during COVID, I would think. And those are actually Bible courses that yes. you can take yeah. online. The Koinonia Institute has sort of has an interesting beginning in that in 2005, Chuck Missler was coming through oftentimes when he'd go to tours and things in Israel, he'd stop in England for a week or so and we'd spend time together and he would always say, I'm coming to plot and scheme with my best friend. And <laughs> so he came to our house and he was sitting there having a meal with us. And he said, well, Nancy and I are getting ready to retire. And I stopped him mid-sentence and I said, excuse me, retirement is not a biblical term. You don't tell me, show me one person that retires. Uh, you mean maybe change direction, slow down, whatever, but you shouldn't retire. And he goes, well, what else am I going to do? I've taught through the Bible you know, I've done, <laughs> I've done all that I, I think I should do. And my wife was the one that said, well, you need to take your material and make it into study material so that home groups can do it. And she was referring to the fact that his wife, Nancy, was already doing that with her Way of Agape series. Right. And then I sort of jumped on that bandwagon and said, well, honestly, I said, you have Calvary Chapel has uh, little Bible schools all over the world. And all they are, for the most part, are people listening to Chuck Smith tapes. And I said, you have a far greater repertoire than Chuck has. And I said, and and now with the with things online, let's create an online school. So by the end of 2005, 2000. 2006, the beginning of 2006, we started Cornini Institute. We had 100 students and began to experiment with online adult education. Today, we have 30,000 students. 30,000. 30,000 students at any one time, there is at least 3,500 to 4,000 people a day taking classes. And the reason why was, again, following me becoming the CEO in 2015, one of the things that I changed was when it was first initiated, there were fees, annual fees for taking the courses. And I eliminated that and made it all free. So That's now wonderful. anybody can go to chaos.org, follow the links to the Institute. They can register at the Institute and all the base courses, Learn the Bible in 24 Hours and things like that, they're all free. And all the courses are free, of course, but even the material, they can watch the videos or listen to the audio or look at the notes, all free. It's my take that the end is near, and we need to be equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. We've been astonished by how many people around the world yes. have taken these courses and are taking them, and now they're what called self-paced courses. You can take them as a group where you can be locked together and talk to each other, or you can take them individually, creating your own, what I call the anthology of your theology, and create your own commentaries and, and so on and so forth. So it's something that we're continuing to promote and provide at no charge to anybody that wants to try that. That's wonderful. And students from around the world as well. Absolutely. Not just Americans. Absolutely, yes. That's amazing. And that's very good news. Very encouraging to know that. And so now I'm going back to from the time you worked with Malcolm, then out in California. Yes. Then how long after that did you go to England? Uh, Malcolm left Southern California in 1984. I left Calvary Chapel in 1980. So I just worked four years on staff there and then decided that I needed to find a tent making skill. And so I carried on as support to him until he left in 1984. Uh, in 1987, the IBM Corporation invited me to set up a consultancy group in their offices in upstate New York. And so I moved my family from Southern California willingly to the beautiful just below the Finger Lakes area of New York, into a place called Owego, and began to work on programs like Space Shuttle and Space Station and so on and so forth as a consultant. Well, in 1991, I worked in the management team putting together a proposal for the Royal Navy. And when they won that job, they invited me to come and begin to work in England. So we moved to Portsmouth, England in 1992, where I was a senior consultant with management information systems. And eventually that division of IBM was sold off to the Lockheed Martin Corporation. And during that transition, I became an employee of that and worked my way into a position or was forced upon me a position of, of increasing responsibility, which led me to be one of their senior program managers. So I stayed in that position for a number of years and also had begun a small Calvary Chapel fellowship there in Portsmouth and then also helping Chuck Messler set up K House Europe. In, in your spare time. In my spare time, <laughs> yes, right. I've always been a behind the scenes kind of guy. I, in fact, in 2011, when we decided to move from England down to New Zealand because Chuck and Nancy had moved there, Chuck was trying to convince uh, my wife and I that we should move down there and just now let's make this, this partnership permanent. And he was always 
promoting me uh, even before that time as a as a conference speaker and and a person to speak alongside of him as a partner in partnership. And I would always tell him, "Look, Chuck, I said you're the you're the one with notoriety. You're the brains. I'm the Joseph in the group. I have no degree. I'm no one from nowhere, and I've done nothing." <laughs> and he goes, "Well, that's not really true." And and I'd say, "Yes, and I also have a face for radio, so I'm not much for for being in front of a camera." But nonetheless, we then moved in 2012 to New Zealand. We officially moved the headquarters of Cornelia House to New Zealand, and people were quite astonished by that. You would take a, a ministry that's 90 percent of its base is in North America, and you would put its uh, headquarters in New Zealand. But nonetheless, we did that for some very strategic regions, and we're there until COVID hit. And then I made the decision that in 2021, November of 21, that we would we would shut down the shop there and move everything back to its original location, which was in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which were, is where we are today. You know, like you do, we just to New Zealand, then we just move the whole thing yes. back to the States. And so how many people are involved in the, the running, the workings of Koinonia House? We have a total of 12 people. We have one person in the warehouse. We have one person in customer service. We have one person that's Johnny Do Everything, all our tours and anything like that. There are no secretaries. Everyone is a worker bee. Then we have a video department of five video and audio editors myself being one of them. It's a very flat organization in that uh, we all are in the bottom of the boat pulling on oars. So I have kind of a concept of the best place to be in ministry is to be working with a team of people in the bottom of the boat. Paul referred to himself as being an under Under rower. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that analogy because by structure eliminates the possibility of competition and all that kind of stuff. And it, it just does. says, we're all in this. We're either going to make it or break it. If everybody grabs the oars, we can we can get to our end destination. So we're a very lean organization. People are surprised considering the reach of the ministry. Chuck Missler yes. with his wicked wit would say, yes, we seem to be awfully small for a, a ministry that reaches so many people. And he said, but you know what happens when you see a man with a very long shadow? It means the sun's about ready to go down. Uh, It was this idea was be careful, but uh, it's a small organization and we're very grateful for not only its continuance, but the growth and increased opportunity. Join us next time as Ron Matson talks about searching the scriptures, thinking critically and finding treasures in the word of God. God. 